folks, this is Pastor Mike Hugger coming to you from the newly restored Studio 2013 with another Watchman video broadcast. We're talking about the power of the flame. I had just recorded part one of this, the Divine Spark, Power of the Flame, uh, on a Wednesday. Thursday I come in here and the studio is about ready to catch on fire. No kidding. Smoke everywhere. The fire department came over quickly. <clears throat> God had me in the right place at the right time and truly I'm, I'm going to read this verse this is what we started out with the last time Isaiah 47 13 behold they shall be actually 47 14 behold they shall be a stubble the fire shall burn them they shall not deliver themselves from the power of the flame <clears throat> the power of the flame is I mean fire things catch on fire we have these buildings full of a electricity and things go bad and that's kind of what happened here was there a spiritual aspect of this well I, I tend to believe so but God protects his people from the power of the flame does that mean that no Christian ever gets burned or the house get burnt no it doesn't mean that the real flames that he protects us from is hellfire we're going to be talking about that we're talking about the power of the flame this is our series our continuing series on the fourth kingdom <clears throat> and I knew it was going to take a while to go through all of this when I happened upon this particular passage here the power of the flame it's like the Holy Ghost was just drawing me and leading me into doing this particular study and the significance of it and I'm telling you it is highly significant let's get our bearings Daniel chapter 2 he speaks of the fourth kingdom that shall rise they are going to mingle themselves with the seed of men and so re just remember that in all of this study that we're doing that's eventually where it all leads to is <clears throat> the idea that these gods this fourth kingdom is going to mingle themselves with the seed of men thus trying to fulfill what Lucifer promised in the Garden of Eden Genesis chapter 3 ye shall be as gods knowing good and evil Paul said in Ephesians chapter 6 we're dealing with this number 4 for we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, powers, um, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, and against spiritual wickedness in high places. And I started dealing with powers, and that's what led me to this verse, the power of the flame. And there are people <clears throat> who have no ability to and cannot deliver themselves from the power of the flame. Let me give you a story in the Bible. Uh, we have Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego that are being thrown into the fiery furnace burning seven times hotter think about that that's a prophecy of what's coming in the last days notice if you go back and read this story this is in Daniel chapter 3 that the people who are throwing the the uh, the, the three young men into the furnace they are destroyed by the power of the flame and yet God's people are not because there's something with them the fourth the Son of God by the way if your Bible called the book or the NIV or any other than the King James when you read I'm just gonna open it up here I've not read this particular passage but I'm going to live on camera exactly what um, Nebuchadnezzar says in here in the King James he says the fourth is like the Son of God here in the uh, what is this the New English version something like that <clears throat> he says um, in uh, verse 25 look Nebuchadnezzar shouted I see four men unbound walking around in the fire they aren't even hurt by the flames and the fourth looks like a divine being mm, 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 mm. <clears throat> that is a long, long, long way away from the fourth being the Son of God. And so God protects His people, but there is, and here's where I'm going with all this, there is a time coming, a time of fire, a baptism of fire, a trial by fire. God is going to release the power of the flame on planet Earth. Who will survive? Who will be destroyed that's what we're looking at and what caught me with this is I've been hearing this about what's called the divine spark 
Uh, and I asked some people, have you ever heard of that? Well, yeah, not people, not too many people know much about it. But in Gnosticism, in um, certain areas of the occult, this is now sort of a teaching that is coming to the forefront of people's knowledge because everybody's hearing this idea, oh, there's, a, there's a, some sort of divine thing inside of you. They unleash something that's in you. You have it in you. It needs to come out. E.T., going to yell, young Elliot and says, I will be right here, okay? So he's going to be inside of Elliot, and then he touches his forehead and gives him the illumination. The divine spark basically says, and we're going to cover this, that every human being has a little spark of a divine being in them. You see, do you see why I quit reading these Bibles? Do you see why I don't study and try to get sermons from these books? They're wrong. They're not just wrong, they're misleading. This Bible teaches you what the divine spark really is, what it's all about. But you see, the teaching is, is that every human being has this inside of them, you have this divine spark. And what happens is that something's going to happen, a transformation, a ritual of some kind, a a new paradigm, a paradigm shift is going to take place and that divine spark is going to erupt into a full flame of divinity. Are you catching that? Because that's where we're going with this study. We left off the last time and I had to go back and kind of reiterate what I was saying and kind of go over what I was saying just so that we can start in the right place. We, were, we had just started talking about the power of the flame and the idea that this flame of divinity, of this divine being, uh, you could point to any one of these books, uh, especially let, yeah, quantum spirituality. Uh, every now and then I, I get these books out and I go back through them again. Marilyn Ferguson in The Aquarian Conspiracy talks about this, this spark, this flame that's going to rise up, this divine being, this new age where people are going to be transformed she even says, she wrote this in 1980, she even says genetically people are going to be transformed. That is, they shall mingle themselves with the seed of men. So we had started talking about this, and we talked about the Kindle, this, this book reader that Amazon.com put out. Now, remember, the love of money is the root of all evil. What is the really underlying reason why Amazon.com wants you to have this electronic reader because they sell books. That's what they're in the business of. But they call it a Kindle. And the reason why this, it's this marketing idea that you read all of these books and it's going to kindle thought. It's going to kindle your imagination. It's going to kindle some sort of flame inside of you. That's the concept because the divine spark, actually, you can see it in the book of Genesis, chapter 3. The divine spark are the words that the serpent spoke to Eve. Remember, his words going out. We, and that's what we were talking about the last time. God said his word is a consuming fire. His word is a fire. We have the cloven tongues of fire that were over the disciples on the day of Pentecost. That is the first coming of Jesus and the second coming of Jesus. But the opposite of that is what James said. He said the tongue is nothing but pure evil, and it's a flame that sets the whole course of the world on fire. The tongue. What is it that a serpent is most noted for? Their forked tongue. The devil's speech is the initiator of that divine spark inside of all human beings. It's called, in the Bible, sin. There's going to come a time when sin is going to become full term. And all of the sin, just like a baby being born, just like Ichabod being born, sin is going to come. James uh, said, lust when it conceived, bring it forth sin. See the wording there? Sin, when it is finished, bringeth forth death. And so the divine spark is the words of Satan. And God actually identifies the kindling and the sparks 
in the pages of the King James Bible. This is what just amazing, because I, I mean, I went through Bible college, and they said, oh, the Gnostics, they did this, and they believed in a divine spark. Okay, that was just something that I'm going, why do I have to know this? Well, I'm glad I knew it, because one day I just decided, I wonder if the word spark is in the King James Bible. It is. That's what we're going to look at. We're going to examine what this divine spark is, how it relates to this fourth kingdom, how it relates to the Antichrist and the transformation of man. Isaiah 50, verse 11. Behold all ye that, notice, notice the language here, that kindle a fire, that compass yourselves about with sparks, that walk in the light of your fire and in the sparks that ye have kindled. This shall ye have of mine hand, ye shall lie down in sorrow. I, got, I just saw something here I've never seen before. Behold, all ye that kindle a fire. So there is the, the little tablet reader that everybody has, the kindle fire. That wording, that language comes right from this Bible. It's absolutely amazing. The more I find out what's in this book, I am stunned and amazed. It's like I just over and over in my mind again, I'm convinced that this Bible is the Word of God and it was written exactly the way it was written for the times that you and I are living in right now. It is the guidebook to give us understanding of what we're seeing all around us. So kindle a fire that, that compass yourselves about with sparks. Now here's what, here's what really gets me going. I've listened to Brent Morris until I'm sick of him. Brent Morris is the spokesman for the Mother Lodge of Freemasonry in Washington, D.C. He's a guy who shows up on the History Channel all the time. He's real acerbic. He's real sort of smart-alecky. And he talks, he makes fun of people who believe that there's a conspiracy in and amongst Freemasons. He just talks nasty, talks down to everybody. And Brent uh, Morris, I think that's his name, Brent Morris, anyway... He talks about, you hear him talk about explaining the square and the compass of Freemasonry. He said the compass basically means we are to circumscribe ourselves as Masons with whatever, whatever, blah, blah, blah. And they, they make that stuff up. You know how I know? Albert Pike said we made it up. We're not telling you the truth. So every time he comes out to explain what a Masonic symbol means, he's lying through his teeth. He's not telling the truth. And their own guy says he's not telling the truth. But that's what they want you to believe. Circumcise. The compass means we're going to circumscribe ourselves with something. Look at that verse. That compass yourselves about with sparks. So now we have something connecting here. The compass in the square and compass actually represents that which is in heaven, the male. The square points down represents that which is in the earth, the female. And this compass represents the sons of God. It represents the fourth kingdom. And this verse says, compass yourselves about with sparks. Now we get a clue here as to what's going on. And he says, walk in the light of your fire, and in the sparks that ye have kindled. Now there's two ways a person can walk. He can either walk according to the doctrines and the ideas and philosophies of men, that is the sparks that ye have kindled, or can walk in the light of the word of God. Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. He said, this shall you have of mine hand, you shall lie down in sorrow. This is not describing saved people. This is lost people. And then he said in Job chapter 5 verse 7, yet man is born unto trouble as the sparks fly upward. Job 18.5, Yea, the light of the wicked shall be put out, and the spark of his fire shall not shine. I'm going to talk about that. Isaiah 131, And the strong shall be as tow, and the maker of it as a spark, and they shall both burn together, and none shall quench them. There is the teaching, the Bible teaching, of what the divine spark really is. So instead of me just saying, I think the divine spark is this, or I think it's Satan's words, or I think it's this. Right here, the Bible's telling us, Yea, the light of the wicked shall be put out, and the spark of his fire shall not shine. So, the wicked. Every time in the Bible, Yea, the light of the wicked shall be put out, and the spark of his fire shall not shine. Right here. And, and every time you see 
the word wicked in the King James Bible. Make a note of it. In fact, just download our software, purebiblesearch.com. Download the free software. The Android version is being worked on. It's a little bit harder than the others. Just study the word wicked because, because in 2 Thessalonians 2, Paul said in verse 8, and then shall that wicked be revealed. Not wicked one, that wicked, capital W in my King James. Why? Because it denotes a proper name of this divine being. He is, the Antichrist is that wicked. So we go back here, yea, the light of the wicked shall be put out. So here's the idea. And in, in masonry and in the New Age and all the mystery ideas, they have this idea that there's this, there was this king or this god or this whatever that uh, had his head cut off or he was crushed and he was broken in pieces. Osiris was killed, cut in 14 pieces, scattered all over the earth. Basically, or, and the, um, in, in the idea of Osiris, once his body was killed, Osiris had 72 pallbearers carrying his body, his dead body. You know what that number means? In Genesis chapter 10, the divisions of all of the families and races of men on the earth number exactly 72. It's amazing. So in the bodies, the flesh bodies of every individual, this divine spark, this fire, the light of the wicked was put out, and the spark of his fire shall not shine. So here is this piece of this very wicked person inside of every human being. How do I know that for sure? Well, I know he's in this one. Oh, I do. I don't like him. I don't, I don't want him. I want him gone. I want him dead. This is why the Bible tells us in the New Testament to, um, to mortify the deeds of this body. Uh, I am crucified with Christ, nevertheless I live. And so we have this idea that it, it, existing in our flesh, Satan planted a spark inside of all humanity. And that spark is awaiting a resurrection, a time when he will become a flame once again right here in the scriptures. And then it says in Isaiah 131, the strong shall be as tow. Tow is what they made ropes out of, okay? It's this whatever vegetation matter that was that they dried and wound it together. That strong shall be as, I gotta stop right here. Masons have in their first three degrees, first three degrees represent the lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, pride of life. First three degrees, the candidate to masonry is dressed, and he's got one sleeve rolled up, one sleeve rolled down, one pant leg rolled up, one pant leg rolled. You know what that is? Opposites. He is, um, I think his left breast is covered, his right breast is open. He's got a blindfold on, and he's wearing what they call a cable toe, which is a three-fold cord, less the flesh, less the eyes, pride of life. It's around his neck. You know why? because he's the hanging man. Cursed is every, anyone who hangeth from a tree. The candidate into Freemasonry represents the Antichrist who in the Garden of Eden was hanging from a tree, the fruit. You see that? Anyway, the strong shall be as tow, I like this, and the maker of it as a spark. And they shall both burn together and none shall quench them. There is a fire, my friends, that is never going to... What, is, what did Jesus say about hell? Where the fire is never quenched. So we're not just talking about some person catching on fire, like a Hollywood stuntman. We're talking about literally the flames of hell itself. Think of, we have three-dimensional flames in our world. Think of a fourth-dimensional flame it's a flame that will never, ever be quenched. Let's take that now and look at this idea of a divine spark. Uh, you see this graphic here. And that, that basically represents the teaching that 
in, in every human, because of what Satan said, the words that came out of his mouth, the serpent's tongue, put a spark, put this little piece of a divine being. Oh, I hate that that book said that. People are reading that. Pastors are reading this from the pulpit. Ah! So everybody has this little piece of this divine being in them. And so the idea is, is that something's going to happen where it's going to come to a full flame of divinity. This idea and this concept, all in the New Age movement, or newage, because it rhymes with sewage. Uh, here is a website here, the Divine Spark Center. Align with your true passion. If you And look here at the bottom, Divine Spark Alchemy. Again, stop right here. Alchemy, and remember, all of this goes back to they shall mingle themselves with the seed of men. Alchemy is all about the transformation of, of from a base substance to a higher substance lead into gold mortals into immortals so the divine spark is the exact same thing as the philosopher's stone or the sorcerer's stone or the holy grail or any of these other terminologies that the occult and the mystery religions and freemasonry uses that's it's all essentially the same idea. And alchemy basically says there's going to be a transmutation, a transformation that's going to take place. By the way, in alchemy, the way that you transform one thing into another is by fire. Fire is the ultimate transformation symbol. Because, I mean, if we, if we had a piece of paper and it caught on fire, 451 degrees. How do I know that? Ray Bradbury, Fahrenheit 451. I read that. But anyway, um, paper catches on fire. What does it do? It transforms it. Now, does it make it better? No. It makes it worse. Um, Bruce Almighty. I've talked about this before. I had to go back and watch the movie again just to make sure I was getting it right. Bruce is this buffoon. He is this clown, and he is all arrogant, and he's all very, he's very self-centered, self-oriented, self this, self that, and he meets Morgan God Freeman. He meets Morgan Freeman, and Freeman transforms Bruce into God. And Bruce is all about doing things to everybody else for himself. And, and so God is trying to teach him a lesson. And at the end, you see this image here. Here is Morgan God Freeman explaining to Bruce the fool that he has a divine spark inside of him. Everybody does. Just waiting to turn him into a god. So people are watching this movie, and it's funny. I mean, Jim Carrey, the guy's hilarious, all right? They're being entertained, but at the same time, what uh, Helen Blavatsky and Elise Bailey said 100 years ago was coming true. They both agreed. I think Bailey was a disciple of Blavatsky. And I think it was Bailey who said, the idea of educating the masses on the idea of the mystery and what it's all about is of paramount importance. We have to teach people the other doctrine, the secret doctrine, but we can't just come out and say, the, all of the New Agers and the occultists, Freemasons cannot come out and say, okay, listen up everybody. Uh, Lucifer is going to come down from heaven with a third of the angels and there's going to be some really bad scorpions rise up from the earth and uh, they're going to give everybody a mark on the right hand or forehead and that's going to change you into gods temporarily but you're all still going to be thrown into the lake of fire. Are we all are we with, us, with us everybody? And everybody's going, no, no, uh, what's for lunch, okay? They can't do that. We, however, can come up and say, um, Hey, listen, we're all sinners doomed to hell. Jesus died for our sins. Would you like to go to heaven? See how simple that is? And it's, and it's honest. It's right. We're not hiding anything. So they all have to keep this secret, and they have to teach it in a secret way. 
but give you just enough to where you watch. I mean, let's be honest. If you watched Bruce Almighty, what would you do if you had godlike powers? See what I'm saying? We're all watching that going, yeah, that's what I'd do. Yeah, that's what I would do. The idea where he's stuck in traffic and he does the Moses thing and, okay. Okay. We've all wanted to do that before, haven't we? See, that's our flesh. That's what's in us. And to turn this flesh with its limitations into a being that doesn't have those limitations, that's bad. That's the flame that we're talking about. That's the flame that's going to compass the entire earth. There are people who the power of the flame has no power on them. We are wrestling against that power right now. Literally, I come over here and I see fire. I don't just go, oh, our church is on fire. I can't do anything about it. Oh, no. Oh, no. I did something. After I called the fire department, I'm, I'm calling God. God needs some help here, okay? And God spared us. Oh, what a good God he is. Look at the, uh, look at the poster for Bruce Almighty. You'll, when you see it, you'll get it. Take a look at it. Oh, yeah. It's just like, I mean, look at the caption. The guy next door just became the guy upstairs. You see the imagery here. This is God giving life to Adam. Actually, he's, this is, stop right here. This is not how it happened. In the Bible, you believe the Bible. In the Bible, God breathed into Adam's nostrils. He didn't give him the finger. And, and touch him with it and shock him into, a, into life. That's not what happened. And by the way, remember, here is God, and you see the mystery doctrine right here. Here is God, and he's got his arm around his red-headed girlfriend. By the way, by the way, Jim Carrey has a slightly strawberry blonde, red-headed girlfriend here called Grace. Think about it, okay? Anyway, so God's got his arm around the red-headed Shekinah, the feminine, the goddess, Ashtaroth, Ishtar, Isis, Diana. That's who that is. That's who Shekinah is. And the idea is that when God mates with Shekinah, see that? He can bring the spark of divinity into a full flame of a divine being. And there you remember that, that uh, idea from E.T. Think about it. Think about, think about the big picture of what's being told here, okay? In Bruce Almighty, a divine being comes down, gives Bruce, a mortal, a divine spark, and, and you know, this God thing. In E.T., an alien comes down to the earth, dies, is resurrected, and gives um, uh, what Elliot the divine spark, illumination in his mind. I'll be right here, okay? So these movies are teaching people this doctrine how can we how can we fight this off how can we not accept this get your shield because what kind of darts does the devil throw fiery ones that's what that's what it says in ephesians chapter six now by the way there is something that i forgot here i'm watching this movie see i, I thought man i gotta go back and watch this because this i'm watching this thing and if you remember this, let me go back to this scene here of Morgan, God, Freeman, with his arm around Bruce. You know where that scene came from? Bruce got killed. And he's talking to God now, and God's going to send him back. And how does he come back? Because God's going Poof, like that. Poof. And the next scene is Bruce Almighty is being sparked back into life. It's all right there. So Bruce is the God who, who is, a, is in a lower state and he dies and he's resurrected. Now he's in a higher state. Uh, let's talk about movies. You, you see that in, if you watch uh, Groundhog Day, Bill Murray, same kind of guy. He's a buffoon. He's smart aleck. He's self-centered, egotistical, 
On the 33rd day of the year, February 2nd, he dies over and over and over and over and over again until he becomes this higher being who's no longer self-centered. That's what all of this is talking about, making good men better through the degrees, through the levels, through the rituals, turning the spark into a flame. Freemasonry refers to this flame as the blazing star. The blazing star. I wonder who that is. How hath thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning? I bet that's who that's talking about. Here's what they say. This is from Morals and Dogma. The blazing star is the image of Horus, the son of Osiris, himself symbolized also by the sun, the author of the seasons, and the god of time. Son of Isis, who is the universal nature, himself the primitive matter, inexhaustible source of life. Look at here. Spark of uncreated fire, universal seed of all beings. It was Hermes also, the master of learning, whose name in Greek is that of the god of Mercury. So, the bla you walk into a Masonic lodge. You see a, see a pentagram on the floor, on the checkerboard floor. There are other things in the Masonic lodge that would represent the blazing star. And if you know anything about it, you know that. But they have as a central idea, the central image, the blazing star. What is the blazing star? It's the Antichrist because it starts out as the divine spark, the seed of the universal, the seed. Remember what Lucifer did to Eve with his 46 words. He gave her the seed, the divine spark. That's what Freemasonry says. He then goes on to say, the soul of man is immortal not the result of organization, nor an aggregate of modes of action of matter, nor a succession of phenomena and perceptions, but an existence, one and identical, a living spirit, a spark of the great central light that hath entered into and dwells in the body. Are you getting that? Albert Pike is teaching basically what we've already discovered. That's what Freemasonry is all about. They're teaching you that there is in all of humanity this universal soul, this spark of uncreated fire, this living spirit, a spark of the great central light. Guess who that is? That is 2 Corinthians 11, Satan being transformed into an angel of light. And so it's like the essence of Lucifer himself as this divine spark in all human beings. And it's awaiting being turned into a full flame of divinity. In Gnosticism, there is a uh, the couple websites. The Gnosticism is still around, by the way. People still believe it. The idea that God put a portion of himself in all humanity. And the hope is that man himself would become this full flame of divinity. Man himself would become a god. Think about what Lucifer promised in Genesis 3. Ye shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. So then Job 41 says, here's the, here's, the Bible's going to tell us the source of this divine spark. I've been trying to get to it. Genesis 3 Watch what the Bible says. Job 41, 19. Out of his mouth go burning lamps and sparks of fire leap out. Guess who that's talking about? Well, you don't have to guess. You can actually go back and read Job 41. You know who that's talking about? Belial, Leviathan, the dragon, the fire-breathing dragon. You ask me if I believe in fire-breathing dragons? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, actually I do, because they're mentioned in the Bible. The fiery flying serpent. All of these are descriptions of Lucifer himself. And when you go and you read Job 41, you see this. You see that out of the serpent's mouth, sparks of fire leap out. And that went into Eve. And now, because we are all the children of and the offspring of Eve, we all have inherited a piece of that divine spark. In Genesis chapter 3, here it is. Here's the story. Now the serpent was more subtle 
than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said unto the woman, Yea, hath God said, Ye shall not eat of every tree of the garden. And the woman said unto the serpent, We may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden, but of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God has said, Ye shall not eat of it, neither shall ye touch it, lest ye die. And the serpent said unto the woman, Ye shall not surely die, for God doth know that in the day ye eat thereof, then your eyes shall be open, and ye shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. Now, there are some people who say, this never had, this is the myth. I think uh, Manley Hall and Albert Pike both say this is the myth. They don't believe it. They don't believe it happened. They think something like this happened, but they all try to make the serpent out to be a good guy, and he's not. I heard one guy talk about how he believed that the serpent was actually better than who he called Yahweh, meaning God, because God, all that God promised Adam was death. The devil, however, the serpent was promising him life. That's a setup, everybody. It's a setup. Don't fall for it. When the flame comes, hopefully God will give you power over that flame, that doctrine, the fiery darts of the devil. How can we have power over it? Remember, our shield of faith. I believe this book, and that quenches the fiery darts of our enemy. And so, and, and think about the opposites. God gives his word to Adam. Satan delivered his word to Eve. You see the opposites? God says, this is what you do. Believe what I said. Satan says, can you really believe what God said? Because God didn't tell you everything. God has a secret doctrine that I am going to reveal to everybody. That's the birth of all the mystery religions. Hence the birth of Freemasonry, the birth of Catholicism, the birth of Babylonian mystery religions, the birth of the New Age, and the conception of the flame of the divine being right there. There is a, um, there is a myth that actually, if you look at it carefully, you can actually see a sort of a corruption of what I just spoke about here in the scriptures. It's the myth of Prometheus. Prometheus is said to have stolen fire or light or divinity from the gods. Look at this photo here. Look at this picture here. This is Prometheus with the hood on. Hood always represents something that's covered like a secret. And here is Prometheus, and he's using a rod, and he's stealing a spark from God. And Prometheus comes down to the earth, and he gives that spark. He gives the secret of flame and fire to mankind. Now mankind doesn't have to shiver in the caves in wintertime. Mankind has the power of the gods because he can make fire. Remember, um, uh, what's the movie, Tom Hanks, Castaway? He had the power of the gods now. I have made fire! Okay, that's Prometheus. Prometheus is the, um, the god there that's at Rockefeller Plaza. Rockefeller. Hmm, Rockefeller and Rothschilds and all these names keep coming up when you start looking at families that have been in the Illuminati. Here's Rockefeller Plaza. Here is Prometheus, and he's surrounded by the Zodiac. And, and get this imagery here. Prometheus is the god. By the way, Prometheus got killed and cut in pieces because he gave the divine spark to mankind. So Prometheus, being circ uh, circled or compassed about by the Zodiac, gives you the idea that here are all these divine beings, these stars, these angels. It's like, uh, it's like Ben Hadad in, in the Bible, and he has his 32 kings with him. So you have the 32 cardinal directions in the stars. You have Prometheus in the middle, 33. Prometheus represents the divine spark, the God who gave fire to man against God's wishes gave fire to man so that man can become a god. I happened upon this one time. Somebody sent me. I, I just don't sit and listen to rock and roll music. I know who Katy Perry is. I know that she came from the church. 
And she did an interview. She said, I guess I sold my soul to the devil. Well, I guess you did, Katie. And everything she does, she even had a video about how her boyfriend was an alien. See, I get, I get that. I understand that, okay? But anyway, there's this song I kept hearing. You know, you go into the mall, you hear this song, you hear kids singing it all the time. And I never really understood. I didn't know the lyrics. I didn't know the words. Somebody sent me a link to the video for this song and said, Pastor Mike, you got to see this. Here's Katy Perry singing, and it actually shows two men kissing. And I went, okay, yeah, I'm going to take a look at that. And then I remember hearing this song. Baby, you're a firework. And I went, what? And I started watching this video. And here's a graphic of it. Here, here's a picture of it. You see Katie singing, you're a firework. And out of Katy Perry is coming what? Sparks. Sparks of divinity. Here is the lyrics that she's singing in this song. There's a spark in you, you just got to ignite. Like a lightning bolt, your heart will glow. And when it's time, think about that, you'll know. You just got to ignite. It's always been inside of you. And I know, I, I mean, I'm not even going to attempt to sing this song in front of everybody, all right? But if you listen to it, you'll, you'll, you'll say, you know what, I've heard that before. Because this is like one of the top songs, and, and people know this song. Baby, you're a firework. What is it doing? It's indoctrinating. It's getting people ready. Just like Bruce Almighty, just like E.T., just like these other movies and films. Um, I'm going to talk about another one here called Trans... Uh, you, you'll see in a minute. Anyway, so this, it's teaching this idea that you have got this divine spark in you, like a lightning bolt... Who's that? Jesus said, I saw Satan as lightning fall from heaven. How art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer? Wow. Think about the symbolism here of this song. And it said, uh, when it's time, you'll know. There is going to come a time. And Katy Perry was talking about it. There is going to come a time when there is going to be a flame, this transformation of mankind. It's going to take place. And she said, it's always been inside of you. Of course it has. You were born with it. This is why your flesh is corrupt and needs to be destroyed. There is one particular image in this video that I want to show you. A woman giving birth to the divine spark. You see it? Unbelievable. There's a new Hunger Games movie. Now, I have not seen the Hunger Games. I've not read the book. I think probably now I'm going to go back and watch because there's a new Hunger Games movie coming out. I saw the theatrical trailer for it. Notice it's called the Hunger Games Catching Fire. Notice what this theatrical trailer said. Every revolution begins with a spark. Hunger Games catching fire. This is indoctrination. This is preparing the minds of people to get ready for a certain day that's going to come. A day of transformation for everybody into these gods. That's what that fourth kingdom is all about, people. I mentioned, I started to mention this movie, I bet you could figure out where I'm going. It's called The Transformers. The Transformers are these cars, these um, trucks and things like that, that all of a sudden transform themselves into these mechanized intelligent beings. They are there to guard what's called the All Spark. This is from um, Wikipedia in the 2007 Transformers live action film, The All Spark is able to bring mechanical and electronic objects to life, essentially turning mundane objects, as long as they are electronic or mechanical, into transformers. That word mundane is all in here. It's all in here. It's all in here. It's all in uh, all these other occult books. Mundane is what you and I are right now. We're this lower life form 
that the AllSpark, tra- guess who the Transformers are in the Transformers movie? You and I, or humanity itself. Think of um, the uh, Planet of the Apes, the rise of the Planet of the Apes. I've watched the trailer for this, and it occurred to me, uh, evolution begin- there's no evolution without a revolution. And it occurred to me that the monkeys and the apes in Rise of the Planet of the Apes was us. And we're going to rise to a higher life form. They had their genetics, their DNA transformed. They had something added to it that made them different. It made them intelligent. It made the, it opened their eyes. Remember there was something in the, if you watch the movie, there's something about their eyes that didn't look like chimps eyes. It looked like human eyes, intelligent eyes, bright eyes. All of this is going into people's minds. Here's a picture of that all spark. Notice that it's a cube. Okay. But a cube actually and uh, Manly Hall talks about this, uh, Morals and Dogma talks about it. A cube, if you take like a box and you unfold it, you know what a cube turns into? Cross, the X chromosome. So where is the divine spark? It's in your chromosomes, it's in your DNA. Um, also, the cube is actually related to the number four, but it's also related to the number six, because if you unfold this box, it makes a cube you have six sections. Think of Genesis 6, the sons of God, the daughters of men. All of this, all of this ties together. All of this is, is together as far as they are teaching one and the same idea and one and the same doctrine. That something in our genetics is going to be transformed and mankind is going to become gods. Um, just do a search on the internet of this spark idea. Uh, Cirque de Soleil has a new show called The Spark. Here's a book, Ignite the Spark. Um, get instant access to the free training videos on how to be confident, peaceful, healthy, and a guilt-free mom. Yeah, right, like that's going to happen. The city calls, a spark to ignite. Ignite, don't fan the flames of despair. Ignite the spark of hope instead. Everything is about igniting the spark. Uh, just, just here a few months ago, out in the Nevada desert, they have this... Um, this retreat that every weirdo and every normal person that wants to be a weirdo or just wants to be with a girl that's a weirdo, they go out to the Nevada desert. They have this great big conference out there. It's all about hedonism. Whatever you want to do, man, that's what you do, man. You talking about drug, sex, and rock and roll. It was everywhere. The central theme of this little conclave they had out in the Nevada desert was called the Burning Man. They literally build this effigy of some dude out of wood or whatever it was, and they light a match, the spark, and they catch it on fire. And that's their God. According to Alex Jones, they do the same thing at the Bohemian Grove, too. They light this big fire. It's called the cremation of care and all this stuff. Uh, here is a, um, here's a graphic here. Women in Design, Kansas City presents Ignite, fueling the next... Look, look at the words here. Ignite, fueling the next... See the word generation? That's got the word genes in it genetics. The spark, they're going to kindle the spark to fuel the next generation. This doesn't have a, what is this, what is this conference about here? Women in design, okay? I don't think it's so much about that as it is about bringing mankind to the point where he says, come on devil, light my fire. And that's exactly what's going to happen. And then, let me see, you see it out here in the world. You see everybody talking about, oh, we're going to ignite a spark. We're going to fan the flames. We're going to fuel the divine flame. You've got, the, you've got something in you. We're going to ignite it and kindle it. All this new age philosophy, this mystery religion philosophy out there. Then you turn around and all of a sudden your church 
is having an Ignite Fellowship, or they're going to an Ignite concert, or they're going to have an Ignite conference, or an Ignite Bible study. They're going to fan the flames, as it were, inside of your church. Here's one, Valley Brook Church. Ignite for young adults. Ignite is a small group of young adults associated with Valley Brook Church and uh, so on. And basically, it's one of these small groups that all these churches are doing to take away pastoral and biblical authority. Notice the symbol. Notice the symbol. Look at there. Valley Brook Church. You see the symbol? It's the same as this one. This basically represents the transformed DNA of mankind. The spark has turned into a flame, and they're using the exact same logo. Here's another one. My, My Ignite Church. You see the logo? It's there. See the ignite symbol? What did we say? Remember, in, last, in the last teaching, I want to say last week's, but we had a fire last week. The week before that, we were talking about this Yod symbol and it, how it represents the number 10 and the 10 kings. It represents the divine spark. They use that on their website, My Ignite Church. Here's another one. Ignite Youth Ministry, a new year, new vision, clear mission. They're going to ignite our young people. What? They're going to catch them on fire? Won't that hurt? Just look at the symbolism here. Here's another one. Church of the, uh, the Newark Church of the Nazarene. Ignite. Ignite challenges students to have such a burning passion for God that they are compelled to be a true Christ follower each and every day and also to share their faith with their peers. Uh, Ignite, our services completely geared towards students. You're invited to join friends for games, live music, small groups, teaching on Wednesday nights at our firehouse location. It's all about catching everybody on fire, catching the church on fire, burning the church, catching the kids on fire, igniting this divine spark. And, 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 And I just want you to stop and ask yourself the question, Is this something that I'm finding in the scripture that we're supposed to kindle the flame and ignite the spark in all of us and all this stuff? It didn't come from the Bible. It came from all of this junk over here. I had this this issue settled in my mind several years ago when I realized, you know, we're trying to find out who's at the top of all these conspiracies. Some say it's the Freemasons. And I started seeing rituals of, of... you know, in churches or in church movements like promise keepers, rituals of uh, indoctrination or, you know, bringing people to new levels. I decided that not every conspiracy in the world was being run by Freemasons. Freemasonry is just the repository of the secret doctrine. Most of them don't know what it is. But there is a spirit that is way beyond the lodge of Freemasons. A spirit, probably Shekinah, that is moving into every area and every aspect of life, be it secular or religious, teaching everybody that they've got a divine spark and it needs to be ignited. Here's another one, Anchor Baptist Church, the Ignite Teen Ministry. Uh, We have an active teen ministry throughout the year. We provide many different avenues of activity and ministry, strive to be an encouragement to help the parents and the ring of their teens in the formative years. And it's all about Ignite. Most, probably, most, if not all, of these churches have walked away from the King James Bible, go into all these weaker, lesser Bibles, where a divine being shows up in the flame. Think about that quantum spirituality and all that garbage, new age practices like contemplative prayer. Oh, let's, let's play a song 20 or 30 times and repeat the same thing over and over again, exactly the way Jesus told us not to worship. Let's do that. So when they walk away from this, this is what they have left. Next Gen Plus, Ignite Academy. The Ignite Academy is committed to training and equipping emerging leaders with accredited academics made practical through Christ-centered discipleship, and on and on and on and on. Next gen, next generation, a new breed of people, Joel's army, that is going to have their genetics changed, 
and the spark that is in them is going to be ignited. Here's another one. Fan the flame. Unleash your child. Now this, this is what got me. This is the Christian Parenting and Home Education Conference of this year. Now, I am all about Christian parenting and home education or Christian education. Uh, I, don't come, I don't go around beating people on the head because they have their kids in public school. We had ours in public school for a while. It didn't work very well for us, all right? Uh, even my son, my oldest son said, Dad, I can't handle it anymore. Okay, so he's being homeschooled right now. So I, I'm all for that. And traditionally, the homeschool movement has been a group of conservative parents who, have, who see what's going on in the world. They see the way that the world is going. They, some of them, most of them believe that there's some kind of agenda to take kids the wrong way. And they said, we don't want our kids going that way. So they pull their kids out. And I just, I want you to focus on this. I want you to think about this. Because just about any place where there's going to be a large conclave, the devil, like promise keepers, I have no doubt the guy that started promise keepers probably had good intentions, okay? Uh, just a men's group and men have problems and men need to deal with their problems and need to get, you know, Christ in their life, okay? May have started out that way. It hasn't ended up that way. Now it's a conglomeration of let's accept everybody and let's bring everybody into the one world religion. That's what it is. And that's what's happening. That's what happens in all the denominations, in the movements, and everything else. So these parents go to this conference, the Christian Parenting and Home Education Conference, and they're being taught to fan the flame. And then it says, unleash your child's inner talents. You've got, your child has got something on a leash inside of him. You know what? I think you ought to leave, if it's tied up, leave it tied up. But we know what that is now. You've got, your child's got some inner thing in him. Why don't you let us fan the flames and kindle the spark and so we can unleash this thing? I would just be very, very cautious and careful. And I know people think you're crazy because you're starting to see stuff now everywhere. Oh, look at there, there's a conspiracy under there. But you know what? There's a conspiracy under there, okay? It's, we would be crazy if the conspiracies weren't true, but they are. And it's my calling, I guess, in life to do all this research to inform you there's a conspiracy under there. When you start seeing them talking about fanning the flames and igniting the spark and kindling this, I don't think, I think I would start backing away or at least being very careful about what you were being taught and what your child was being taught. Max Lucado believes in the divine spark. This is his book, The Cure for Common Life, he says, and I quote, Jewish theologian, stop right here. Stop right here. Jewish theologian, this is what I've come to realize. Jewish theologian means a Kabbalist. That's what a Jewish theologian is. He's in the Kabbalah. And the Kabbalah is all about the divine spark. You're going to see it. Jewish theologian Martin Buber writes, The world is an irradiation of God, but as it is endowed with an independence of existence and striving, it is apt always and everywhere to form a crust around itself. Thus, a divine spark lives in everything and being, but each such spark is enclosed by an isolating shell. Only man can liberate it in a holy manner. That is... I, I got to stop right here. I'm just, I am, I am dumbfounded at what I'm reading from a Christian author. Yeah, well, he's quoting this Kabbalist theologian. Why? You see, I'm quoting the Kabbalist theologian, but I'm telling you, this guy's a heretic and he's going to lead people to hell. He himself is going to hell if he doesn't get saved. 
Max Lucado is writing this as a, as a thing that he wants you to philosophize on, and he wants you to accept it, because, you know, we, I, I sort of agree with this. Everybody has a divine spark. So he says, only man can liberate it in a holy manner. That just ticks me off, by the way. That is, so that his intention in doing so remains directed toward God's transcendence. Thus, the divine eminence emerges from the exile of the shells. Max Lucado, Cure for the Common Life, 2005, W Publishing Group, Nashville, Tennessee. I think, I'm not kidding you, I have never read Daniel 3 from the book until today. And when I read in here that there is a divine being in the fire, and then I read the Kabbalist theologian who is saying the exact same thing, the divine eminence, emerges from the exile of the shells. You know, you remember when we were talking about this, the yod symbol related to the, um, the circumpunct, the dot within a circle. And that dot represents this thing that's bound up and locked up inside of there. Basically, it's the beast in the heart of the earth. He needs to emerge out of that shell. The divine spark needs to burn his way, way through like lava out of all the out of volcano and turn man into a god and only watch this only man can liberate it in a holy manner that max is another gospel it's not the real one we don't liberate god he liberates us false doctrine everywhere people Benny Hinn. Benny Hinn. Roman Catholic, mystic, even wears the little priest collar. Paula White's ex-boyfriend. Don't forget that. Benny Hinn has a fire anointing. Hinn told viewers, quote, that incredible anointing that hit at one point in that service is something that I'll never forget as long as I live. Then he divulged, listen, saints, what we're about to show you, we are rarely show on any program. The fire of God hit, and the Lord kept saying to me, say, fire, speak the word fire. And as I did, you're about to see the result. You may never be the same again after this. Really? That's exactly what I've been saying. The divine spark, the fire. Benny Hinn's fire anointing is nothing more than the paradigm shift that is coming. He is setting his people up. Max Volcano is setting his people up. All of these others, Joyce and, and Joel and all these guys, they're setting everybody up to receive a mark in their right hand or in their forehead. And they're going to tell them, no, God wants you to do this. God wants you to. God, God told me he wants you to do. Oh, God told. Okay, because you're from God. People, people, get back to your Bible. Read your Bible. Then he says, we're about to receive a revelation of him, for I believe the body of Christ is ready now for a fresh manifestation of Christ. There's coming a time in our lives as believers when we're going to have a fresh revelation of who he is, and we're going to come into a new walk with him. Remember, he declared we would be baptized with fire. Fire, ladies and gentlemen. I want you to know the day will come when the fire of God's presence will visibly appear in public meetings. You may never heard you may have never heard that before. It's biblical. We've known we've known the baptism of the Holy Ghost, but we have not known the fire. And I'm here to tell you in Southern California, God is about to visit you and the whole church with fresh fire. It's a setup. Hen is setting you up. He's setting you up to go get a mark in your right hand, to, to ignite your divine spark, that to unleash. When, when you hear these guys, Hen and Creflo and Joyce and all of these guys, Joel uh, Osteen, Joel's army, when you hear Todd Bentley, when you hear these guys talking about, you need to release your faith. It's, it's bound inside of you. You need to release. And they, they make all these gestures and make all this funny talk. Release this like snakes. They're basically teaching you the divine spark doctrine that you've got this little God on the inside of you that can create anything it wants to. You just got to just let him out, let him go. It's a setup, false doctrine. You follow this, 
you're fixing to go get a mark in your right hand or in your forehead if you live long enough. Leviticus chapter 10, verse 1, And Nadab and Abihu, the sons of Aaron, took either of them his censer and put fire therein and put incense thereon and offered strange fire before the Lord, which he commanded them not. You say, well, you know, I've read this before. What is that strange fire, Pastor Mike? Well, it actually gives you the clues right here. Strange fire, which he commanded them not. Strange fire. These are words that, who publishes this? Tyndale House. William Tyndale would roll over in his grave. Okay? These are words that Tyndale House wants you to believe that God said. Don't fall for it. God never said that there was a divine being in the fire. He never said it. There are countless other contradictions in this book against what's in this book. This, both of them can't be the Word of God because they're contradictory to one another. One of them's got to be lying. It's this one, the one that's telling you that a divine... I wonder what, and I promise you I've never done this before. I've always looked at the NIV and these other... I'm just wondering to see who fell from heaven. In Isaiah 14... How are you fallen from heaven, O oh shining star? Anyway, the strange fire is the words that God commanded not. So these churches are offering strange words. His words are fire. Thus, the strange fire that God hates are all these false doctrines and false teachings like you need to ignite something in you, and you need to go to contemplative prayer sessions, and you need to do this and release the God that's on the inside of you. He's trying to talk to you, and you're not listening. That's what that's all about. So you see all these, like Benny Hinn's talking about his fire anointing. You hear these, uh, these talks of fire, Oakwood Community Church, Soul Fire Youth Ministry, Soul Fire Ministries. Uh, it's real funny. Look up on the screen there, and you see Soul Fire Ministries, and here's the song they're singing. La, 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 We're going to sing like the saved. Really? I mean, I'd much rather stick with this little light of mine. I'm going to let it shine. The fire, it's a setup. Reinhard Bonk. What a name. Christ for all nations. Oh he's, oh, he's big. He's got the big following from all. Oh, he's, oh, he's saved millions of people. Reinhard Bonk has not saved anybody. Man can't do that. Only Christ can. So his limited 50th anniversary edition, his, uh, his website says, Fuel for your fire. Living a life of fire. Think about it. Where does all this divine spark, flame stuff that's in the church right now, where is it coming from? Have you noticed in the last few years, there's been like this influx of Hebrewisms in the church? Um, books being written about, you know, the gospel that Jesus read. Well, that's basically trying to teach you that Jesus really was a Jew. If you want to understand Christ, you've got to understand the Jewish and Jewish philosophy. Jewish traditions, Jewish mysticism. you got to understand all that. The Hebrew Roots Movement, Sacred Name Movement, same thing. Telling you, oh, you got to go back to the Hebraic understanding, the Hebrew idea. After all, Jesus was a Hebrew and all the disciples were Hebrews. And, and we don't understand it the way they did because we have this Greco-Romanized, paganized, that's what Jim Staley says all the time. I'm going to show you something that he said here in just a little bit. These people are dangerous because they have many who are following their pernicious ways. By the way, they all hate the King James Bible. They hate it. They can't say, you know why? Because the King James Bible contradicts their doctrine. Contradicts it. So it says, now that, that wasn't translated right. In a better translation in the Hebrew, if it would have been written in Hebrew, it would have said this. Where does all this come from? 
I did a little research. I heard Jim Staley say something and I went, I never heard that before. Where did that, I never had heard anything like this before in my life. Where did he get that? It took me five minutes to find out where he got it from. You just wait and see. All of this Hebrew stuff that's moving into the church, let me tell you what it's really all about. Jewish mysticism, the Kabbalah. They are the ones who teach that everybody has a divine spark in them, given to them by their God. And it awaits some sort of transformation to be turned into a kindling, to be turned into the full flame of divinity. Here is a website, yeshiva.org. Uh, Rabbi Zalman Baruch Melamed, The History of the Divine. He talks about the story, he, he talks about the divine spark. He says, the story of humankind in the Torah then is no less than an account of the evolution of the divine spark in man. What makes the Jewish people unique is the fact that this divine element attached itself to them. It follows that the Jews are like the heart and head of humanity. Israel illuminates all the nations of the world with this divine inner light which they carry. Just as the heart gives life to the entire body and acts as a power station for all the body's organs, so the Jewish people gives life to the entire world via this divine light which permeates them. Israel acts as a link between creation and the Creator. Are you catching this? Now, you should, if you've listened to me before, you should know my stand on Israel. God loves them. Jesus loves them. I love them. They are going to be saved with a mighty salvation at the end time. They are God's people, but God divorced them for a reason. Their heart and their mind is so turned away from the God of this Bible. Even the God of the Old Testament. And you hear them talk about the Old Testament and the Tanakh and, the, and this and that and the other. You hear, and they, you hear them talk about that and you have the idea that I had for years was, these people, they're just poor lost souls. They don't know who Jesus is. Why, if I just talked to them, they would know. Are you kidding me? These people's minds and heart is so foolish and so blinded. They Remember, God put a veil over their face, over the face of Moses. Every time they read the Old Testament, they don't get it, and they're not going to until the veil is lifted. Who is it that brought about the death of Jesus Christ? It's Israel. Who are the fiercest opponents? You read the book of Acts. The fiercest opponents of the gospel, the Jews. Even the Apostle Paul, a Jew, one of them, said in Galatians 4 when he's talking about that story of, of Hagar and, um, and Ishmael and Sarah and Isaac. And he said, then as now, just as Hagar and Ishmael persecuted Sarah and Isaac, so those who were born from Mount Sinai persecute those who are free. They hate it. They hate this Bible. They hate Christianity. And I'm telling you, they've got it as their goal. It says right here, they've got it as their goal. Since they believe that they are the light of the divine spark to the entire world, they have it as their goal to Hebrewize everybody in the world and lead them to this divine knowledge that they have. Basically, it's the Kabbalah. It's, it's the birthing and the coming of the Antichrist. The Jews themselves are going to bring this about. And so when you, see, when you see this mindset, they will stop at nothing to gain influence in political realms and religious realms. And they have moved into the church. You see, what, what is it about Judaism? Works, salvation. We perform, God gives. That's what it's about. You see it everywhere now. Preachers telling you, now if you'll do this, God will do this. It, where did they get that from? Got it from the Old Testament. God didn't say that here. He says, if you'll believe, I'll do. I'll do and do and do and do. You can't, you can, oh, you can't do this? I know you can't. But if you trust me, I'll do it for you. 
And that's what God did. But you see these elements of, of law-keeping in all of these Christian groups. And in the, especially in the Hebrew roots or Messianic Judaism idea. Now, I know that not all of them are bad. I know that. But I am super suspicious of anybody who starts leaning to the Hebrew way because I know where it came from and I know, I know the spark that's going to catch on fire one of these days. So, right here. Here is from another website, Torah.org. Have the Jewish people related to the Torah as a set of instructions to govern and improve their material lives, they would have undoubtedly have responded with a plethora of questions, opinions, and suggestions. But they understood that the Torah functions on a much more profound level, that it is the channel which connects the divine spark within each of us to the master of the universe that it provides the wings on which our spirits can soar to the highest spheres of heaven. In this light, there were no divisions among them, and they responded with a spontaneous consensus. Again, the Kabbalah and the Jewish religion, and now they're teaching that the Torah. See, the Torah to the Jews is much more than just the laws that God gave on Mount Sinai. Jews have a different idea about it. The Kabbalists have a different idea about it that there's something hidden in the Torah, a divine spark, a secret doctrine that Moses actually heard from God, but he didn't write it down. He passed it along orally to the rabbis who carried on that tradition all the way until now. And now they're inseminating the church with that same mystery doctrine. And here basically is what it is. You see here, this is the top part of the Kabbalah tree of life, the Sephiroth. You have the, the Chakma in the Bina, which is the male and the female, and the Kether, which is the crown, and what you're seeing is the illumination of the divine spark. Kether has many names. It is called existence of existences, or concealed of the concealed, ancient of the ancients, ancient of days, the primordial point, the point within the circle, the most high, the vast countenance, the whitehead, macro prosper, Prosopus, Amen, Luxaculta, Lus Interna. It stands for the union with God. It can be termed as the completion of the great work of alchemists. It corresponds to the divine spark. Kether is the Lux Interna, the internal light, the divine spark, which is the warrant for our divine nature. Kether shows us that the throne of God is located not in heaven, but in the center of our brain. In our third ventricle, also called the thousand-petaled lotus by Hindus, and Ni Huan Palace, or Nirvana, by the Chinese. Wow. The, and this is from uh, Esoteric Online. It's teaching you the secret of the Kabbalah. The divine spark is called the point within the circle. Remember we talked about that. That point within the circle basically means you're the shell, you're the circle, and the point here is the divine spark. It's the beast that's hidden in there. He's dead. He needs to be awakened and released and resurrected and come out of the shell. That's why an egg, think of Easter, is such a high occult symbol because the shell conceals something that's alive in there. It needs to be brought out in the open. Think about all these ideas. He said here the Kether shows us that God, let me show you this Kether again. The Kether, the crown, shows you that God is not in heaven, but he's in the center of your brain. You know what's in the center of your brain? The pineal gland. Let me go back to this graphic here. Of uh, I know we're going to go way back here a little bit, but this gra gra graphic of Bruce Almighty and God touching Adam when you look at God here with his arm around Shekinah, you see that red tapestry in the background and all that stuff there? You know what that is? That's a cross-section of the human brain. Michelangelo knew his stuff, and he drew a picture of half of your brain, and he put Yahweh and Shekinah in there mating, and right 
right where the central part of God, I'll say it that way, is, is where your pineal gland is. That's where you get, according to all of the occultists and all the newagers and everybody else, that's where you get your awakening from. Actually, if you remember, the pineal gland it reacts to light. When the lights go out, your pineal gland activates when the lights go out. Releases this chemical in your body that makes you sleepy. And when the light comes on in the morning, your eyelids, they're kind of paper thin, they can see the light coming in there. It's, it's called your third eye because it, it perceives light. And when the light comes on, the real light, when the light comes on, your pineal gland deactivates and it stops releasing that chemical and you wake up. See how that works? So why are all these new ages and all these ideas, even in the church, telling you that you need an awakening? When Paul said that the church is already awake, we're children of the day, we're not asleep. Why is it that they tell us that we need to have our pineal gland activated? And they say that will bring an awakening. It's not true. It'll put us to sleep. You think about what's being taught here, what this divine spark represents. I'm going to read a couple more things. Uh, this is from a group, Partners in Torah. Through learning Torah, we come to appreciate the wisdom and values which help us improve ourselves and energize our divine spark. Torah is the blueprint for life, helping us navigate through the many decisions we face on a daily basis. In addition to self-improvement, Torah has also served as protection in times of war. So here's what they're telling you. They're telling you that there's something about the Torah, the law, the Pentateuch, the five books, the commands given by God. As Jim Staley always puts it, and all the Hebrew roots people, Torah means basic instructions in life. That's what this says, the blueprint for life. Who works with blueprint? The architect. See the language here? But anyway, they're telling you that the Torah actually contains the secrets. Kabbalah teaches that there's a secret doctrine given to Moses that was hidden inside the Torah. Now remember what the Torah is represented by. Ten. Ten commandments. Ten toes of the fourth kingdom. Whenever I see someone, I don't care who it is, all of these Hebrew Roots people or the Seventh Day people or any of these people on Facebook who are climbing all over Christians because they don't keep the Sabbath and you eat pork and you do this and you... Whenever I see that going on, listen, I have a love and a reverence and a respect for God's law. I do. God's law as it is written in this book. I have a respect for it but I'm not saved, nor do I please God when I try to keep one of those laws. I don't even please God when I try to keep nine of the commandments. God's not pleased unless you're keeping all ten. But whenever I see someone leaning back toward the ten, I see a setup coming, trying to get you back under the dominion of the law. What's so bad about that, Mike? The problem is you can't keep it. They lie to you by telling you we can do as much as we can. That pleases God. That's a lie, and you know it. In the Ezekiel 33, the moment, let's say you did nine things completely right. The moment you lusted after your neighbor's house or your neighbor's whatever, all of that righteousness is gone. And you know that. That's what the Word says. Whenever I see them trying to drag people back under the Torah, the Ten Commandments. I know that this is a setup for the fourth kingdom, and that's what it is. One man in particular, he don't like me. I'm going to talk about him next week. His doctrine, 
because he's so widely accepted, is so subtle yet so dangerous. I'm going to show you next week that he spoke doctrines directly from the Sephiroth, the, um, the Zohar, Jewish Kabbalah, Jewish mysticism. It's the only place he got it from. And he's teaching it to the church. And it's all about the divine spark and what's hidden inside the Torah. I'll give you a hint. It's a flame that's in there. And you're going to see it from coming from his mouth, exactly what he said. And we pick this back up again next week. Giving you a lot of information. Take it. Go back to the scriptures. Do some study. Do some research on your own. If you happen to be part of a church or a group that says, hey, we're going to ignite this. We're going to spark this. We're going to kindle this. We're going to fan the flames. We're going to get the flame going in you. I, you know, I just, I would just be careful. With that, all right. And that's really all I'm trying to get you to do. Because remember, it looks crazy when we're going, hey, there's a conspiracy under here. But if there actually is one, then we're not so crazy, are we? And if you'll open your eyes or let God open your eyes, you'll start seeing. If you'll read this book, you'll start seeing. It. That's how I found about the divine spark and being kindled in the flames. It came from this book. And now we know what's going on and where we're headed. Does this have any relevance to the church? I believe it does. And I'm going to show you that as we finish this out. This is Pastor Mike. It's good to be with you. Good to be back in our top secret broadcasting bunker. We'll see you next time. Bye-bye.